Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm gonna to get to a computer that I've had since January 2020, and I've been meaning to work on the entire time. So finally, I'm going to do that. The machine in question is this thing, which looks like it's just an explosion of parts. It's actually an Amiga 1000 that was donated to the channel by Desi, and actually I made a video about it that was also in January of 2020. So I'll link that below so you can watch that to see me go out to the coast of Oregon, the beautiful coast, and pick up this machine. When Desi gave me the machine, he mentioned that it had some problems with audio, but otherwise mostly worked. He had tried to get a GoTech drive in this machine, but it was a custom mount and he didn't have a 3D printer, so it was all a little janky, shall we say. I've since removed that GoTech and I used it somewhere else. And I actually have an original disk drive here that should work in this machine, so I can restore this back to the way it was. Even though the machine looks like it doesn't have all the parts here, I actually have a box that's off camera there that has all the missing parts, like the face plates and the screws and stuff like that. So I should be able to assemble this into a fully complete Amiga 1000. So without further ado, let's dig into this machine. <laughs> All right, the Amiga 1000, I think after I get it working, I'm definitely gonna have to do some work giving it a little retro bright, a little bit of a clean. Like the keyboard here, it's just, uh, well, it's seen a little bit better days, but luckily no broken keys and it all looks in really good shape. Well, the machine itself, it's a little scratched up on the top, but I think nothing that a little magic eraser shouldn't fix. Probably needs a little bit of a retro bright just because there's some yellowing going. It's the lid of the Amiga 1000 that has signatures of all the designers and the people who worked on the project, which is just pretty awesome to see. The original Macintosh had this as well, I think in 1984. So this machine came out in 85. So, you know, they borrowed that from Apple and probably others before them had done the same thing. So the Amiga 1000, here's the inside of it. Now, of course, this is the very first Amiga computer came out in 1985. All those amazing coprocessors were in here, allowing it to have true multitasking, like right from the very get-go. Of course, the Atari ST, the competitor to the Amiga, much cheaper, came out a little bit before this machine did. I won't get into the Atari versus ST debate, but I mean, look, let's be honest, right? The Atari ST is a very simple machine. It's got a processor, it's got RAM. The RAM itself holds the frame buffer. The CPU has to do all the work in the frame buffer, moving pixels around. There's like no coprocessors whatsoever in that machine. So it doesn't really come close to the capability of the Amiga, which at the time when this came out, it just sort of blew everything else away. Now, I think I talked about this in the original video when I went out to the coast after I brought it home, but I don't quite remember because it's been so long and I haven't rewatched my video yet, which I will in a second. This board has this add-on here, which you might be wondering what that's all about. Well, originally when Commodore was ready to release this machine, they weren't quite ready with the Kickstart ROM. So what they did is they added this board here, which has RAM on it. I think it might have 256K of RAM. And the RAM is able to be written to when you first boot the machine, and it loads the Kickstart into this special RAM board, and then it right protects it, it becomes ROM. After that, you can reboot the machine as long as you don't power cycle it. The Kickstart ROM, which is loaded into the RAM here, is able to work as a ROM chip. I think the motherboard has 256K of RAM on it, and then this little adapter board that plugs in the front, and there's a little cover that allows you to access it while the case is all back together, gives you a total of 512K of user memory. This machine came with an extra board here that was plugged into the CPU socket, and I think it went... Yes, uh, so the floppy cable, it was under here like this. Ignore this blackboard that's on top. And this was an extra RAM expansion to give more memory to the Amiga 1000 to make it a little bit more usable than just that 512K of user RAM. The board that's plugged in on the top here was a donation to me. And what this does is it gives the machine kickstart ROM capability as well. Theoretically, you don't need to use this RAM board anymore and then you can install a normal Kickstart ROM, like Kickstart 1.3, and when you turn the computer on, of course, as it has a ROM chip, the Kickstart's available right away. Now, I was testing to see if I could install both this RAM expansion board here and the Kickstart board at the same time. Maybe it's possible I sort of have it all stacked up together there. Although, 
I think with all of this in here, it's not possible to reinstall the RF shield. I think everything else will fit, but there's a large RF shield that goes on top of this. It won't work with all this little stack of stuff in here. But I think for testing initially and simplicity, I'm gonna pull out the CPU from this board and we're gonna stick that right back in the motherboard. And then I can test this machine without all this extra board stuff uh, just to rule out any potential issues. The markings on the board here says it's a Rev A board. And the date codes that I can see on chips that are soldered on are from 1985. So this is very much an early Amiga 1000. So this CPU I have here is not the one I just took off that stack of stuff. This is another one I had uh, in a little bag of parts. I'm looking at how this board attaches here. It looks like there's some long pin sockets that plug into some of the ICs that are on the motherboard. That's pretty hilarious. It was definitely an afterthought when Commodore designed and added this into the machine. <laughs> I'm gonna leave the floppy drive disconnected for now and the keyboard and everything else. Monitor is connected. Let me grab a power cord because this has an integrated power supply, which I kind of dig. Seems like the power supply is a little bit loose, so don't know if it clips in or is it supposed to be screwed in. Power switch is right here on the side and let's turn this on. Okay, we're getting the normal Amiga looking start. The fan is running, though that's pretty gray. The fact that it changed from black to gray implies that the CPU is actually working. Okay, look at this. It's gone to the white screen, which is normal. Now, I'm expecting it to have a kickstart disk icon, which will be the bootstrap loader that's on this thing, telling you to insert the kickstart disk, which loads it into this RAM board here. This whole process is certainly taking a long time. Now, the fact that drive's not connected, it, it might be trying to load off that and it might be trying indefinitely. So I think I should try hooking up this floppy drive. I can say that the image looks totally stable and it's really good, so it's like we're getting clean voltages out of the power supply. This drive I took out of an external Amiga floppy drive. I think it's called the 1050 maybe, and it looked to be the same drive as a 1000 drive. So I felt okay taking apart the 1050 to sacrifice it basically to put it in here. Ah uh, yes, by the way, this is the faceplate that goes on the front. Oh, look at that, kickstart freaking working. So this is the original faceplate for the 1000 here. Their power LED slides into the case there and there is the power LED for the disk drive. And it definitely has a little cable here that connects up to this cable. So it looks like that little situation is going to be fine. Okay, I went into my box of disks and I found a couple Kickstart disks. Uh, the top one here being Kickstart 1.3. So why don't we give this a try? This, this disk is really dirty. Inside looks okay though. Does this work? It's kind of making clicky noises and I don't know if it's making the right sounds. I guess, sounds like it's loading something. Now it'll be loading the kickstart into here and then we should get a workbench disc. Okay, so we got another kickstart disc image uh, loader thing there, which implies it did not work. I'm gonna try this other one. Uh-oh, this drive is acting up, okay. It was kind of going away as if the drive thinks there's a disc in there. Hmm, okay, the problem might be bad kickstart disks, right? I don't know if these work or not, or the problem could well be that this drive is dirty or gummed up or something else is wrong with it. Okay, for making a new kickstart disk, I'm gonna use the Cryoflux hooked up to just a regular PC disk drive and a 720K disk here. I'm actually powering the disk drive off the Amiga 1000 just because it's easier than getting out my extra power supply since this is sitting here. Cryoflux is connected. And on archive.org, I found a copy of all the Amiga 1000 Kickstart discs, all the way from the very first one here in 1985 to 1.3, which is what I'm gonna write to this disc. Cryoflux isn't the best tool for writing out discs, unless it's one that was archived on a Cryoflux, a stream file, but it does support writing ADF files along with Commodore 64 G64 images. I'm gonna try writing, and I think you gotta do it like this. Let's see if that works. It's trying. No, write operation failed. Disk is write protected. Well, that would cause a problem. Let's try that again. Okay, here we go. Okay, it's going. It's kind of slow, but it's going. Ooh, okay, it looks like a few tracks here didn't work properly, but I'm not sure that's necessarily gonna matter. So why don't I unplug the cryoflex here? Let's turn off the Amiga and let's switch back to the internal floppy drive. All righty, let's turn that back on. This drive is plugged back in. Let's try this disc now. I mean, I'm pretty sure this is a good 800K disc or 720K disc, but maybe it has issues, I don't know. All right, it's definitely attempting to load Kickstart right now. Let's see if it's able to load the whole thing. 
Okay, it rebooted. That's a great sign. Now it should say workbench and it does and it says 1.3. So, okay, well that's a good disc. So these two kickstart discs are bad. They're gonna go in the trash. I'm just gonna go right and try to load the Amiga test kit on this thing. Let's uh, skip loading an actual workbench. Let's try the test disc. All right, that loaded right up. OCS NTSC 68,000, 60 Hertz. Amiga test kit 1.1. Alrighty, we have 512K of chip memory detected, so that is correct. So let's just do a quick RAM test, make sure all the RAM is working on this thing. Of course, the Kickstart RAM is not included in this, but it must be working because of course, this thing is booted, which definitely requires a working Kickstart. All right, it's already done three passes successfully, so I guess it's working. It's going pretty quickly too. Here's the video test in Amiga test kit, looks perfect. Here's the CIA timer test, all tests passed. And next up, I wanna test the audio. And I kinda of remember Desi telling me that that was the big problem with this computer. So I have the speakers here. Let's plug those into the outputs. All right, we would be hearing the music right now. And I currently hear nothing at all. There's just a little bit of a buzz coming out of the speaker and that's it. Okay, I'm just gonna reboot. I'm putting in a kickstart disc, or sorry, workbench disc. I wanna make sure that it boots into workbench properly. Now, because I did a soft reboot to kickstart, it's still in memory here in the read-only memory. Now, the image on the screen looks perfect. It's super sharp. There's no interference or lines that might indicate bad caps or something inside the power supply. So that's excellent. And there it is. We're booted right up into Workbench, and all looks good. All righty. So this computer definitely appears to be working perfectly, except for the audio. So next thing to do, let's go to the schematics. All right, I have the schematics for the 1000 up on the computer here, and it's one sheet for the whole computer, so it's a little bit complicated. The first thing we need to do for this machine is try to figure out where the sound is coming from. Now, if you know your Amiga architecture, it's the Paula chip that generates the four channel stereo digital audio on this machine. On the schematic, here's the Paula chip 8364. So here's the left channel audio output pin 31 and the right channel audio output pin 30. The audio signal travels through two op amps for each channel and then a bunch of passive components to the final output jack on the back of the machine here. That is replicated times two for the stereo audio. And I'm noticing there's a wire or a trace that shoots off there on the left channel. And it looks like that trace goes up to the serial port, which has an audio out pin. Who knew? And it's only hooked up to the left channel and that's it. And then if you notice here, there's a resistor and a resistor on both of the right and left channels and the traces go down here to the RF modulator jack, which is this DIN connector here on the back of the machine. Anyhow, back to the sound problem. So what we need to do is we need to output some music and then check pins 30 and 31 on the Paula chip just to see if we even have any sound coming out of the Paula chip at all. So I'm just gonna start the audio playback here, which is playing a mod file. It's spice it up. I do have these speakers hooked up right now and I hear the buzz, but I actually hear a little bit of audio. If I turn it up really loud, I can hear a little bit of sound out of one of the speakers. Quite a bit of buzzing though as well. All right, we're gonna be using the oscilloscope because of course that's the best thing to use for tracing audio issues. Now this right here is the Paula IC and pin one is down here on the bottom right facing me. You can see there's a little gold pin there. It is a 48 pin IC, so that's pin one, that's pin 24, pin 25 is right there where the yellow dot is. And right there, I am on pin 30, and take a look at that on the oscilloscope, we see the sound waveform, so that's good. That means the Paula chip is not damaged, at least on this channel. Let's check the next one, there's one more pin up, and there it is, and it looks perfect. So we have confirmed that audio is right here and right here going into pin 13 and pin nine on this TL084 op amp. It's a quad op amp chip. So all four of these op amps are actually in one IC. Now I've done some looking on the board here and I found the op amp. It is underneath the RAM board. That is a huge pain. I need to be able to probe these passive circuits and things just to see what exactly is broken here. And unfortunately, one of the issues is this Amiga will not run with that board removed. Even if I install that kickstart board into the CPU socket, the problem is when Commodore adapted the machine to take this board, they removed a bunch of the ICs off the motherboard and they stuck them on this board. So pulling this off means that those chips won't be connected anymore. 
And that means I can't boot and I can't play any music to test the audio path. What a pain. I have an idea though. The motherboard doesn't even appear to be screwed into the case. What if I take the disk drive out and I try to take the motherboard out of the case and run it on its side so I can probe the bottom of it? All right, the motherboard is free. It was definitely very fiddly on the corner there. And there's the very dusty and dirty RF shield on the bottom. Now the bottom of the PCB is really clean. <laughs> the top, it's pretty dusty. So definitely while this thing's out, it's gonna be getting a full wash. Now it's not easy to show on camera, but I can see that right down there, that's the op amp chip. And I think the passive components, I can see some values on some resistor and, th and things that match the schematic. So it's just off the edge there. And flipping it over, that is the IC right there. These are some of the passive components. Unfortunately, it's not labeled on the back. So what I'm going to try to do is get this all hooked up with the motherboard up on its side like this so I can test the bottom and it's all gonna be pretty precarious. All right, I said precarious and that's absolutely what it is, but it's fine. All the RF shields are removed. So there's no metal on the bottom of the case. And I even have a mouse pad there. It's sort of taking the stress off the post that this is lying on. I have a mouse connected, the power's connected to the floppy drive. I think we're good to go. Gotta take this out and put the kickstart disc back in. So it's, it's seemingly booting up. So good sign. All right, here we go. Kickstart 1.3. There we go. Disk drive is making a weird clicky noise. Maybe it does not run properly on its side. Well, I gotta say, that is frustrating. The drive went from working to not working. Much, much, much later. Alrighty, we're at the workbench prompt. I had to use, I don't know, this is a PC floppy drive with an adapter for the Amiga because yeah, no matter what I did, I could not get this disk drive working again. Unfortunately, I cannot mount this disk drive into the 1000 and have it actually work. So I'm gonna have to find another external Amiga disk drive and salvage the floppy drive out of it. What is important to keep though is this, which is the actual top plate that goes in the Amiga 1000 and it has all these mounting tabs on the side. I don't think this is what's inside one of those external disk drives. Okay, let's get back to the sound problem. So I have the test kit disk here. Let's boot that up. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, the machine just booted off the Kickstart disc. Let's try this workbench disc here. I gotta say, sometimes I absolutely hate working on old disc drives. The workbench disc here, that's working perfectly. Although it may not boot because I don't have the RAM expansion on the front of the machine. What the heck happened to my Amiga test kit disc? Why does this not work all of a sudden? Maybe this disc is somehow ruined. Maybe sticking it in that other disc drive killed this disc. Well, the kickstart loaded without issue. Let's put this back in. Oh, the, oh, the disc got ruined somehow. Okay, time for another jump cut while I go make a new floppy disk. Alrighty, I am finally booted up into Amiga Test Kit and actually updated to uh, the newest version 1.18 while I was at it. I used the same floppy disk again so it wasn't like that disc was bad because it verified when it was written perfectly, but for whatever reason, it wasn't readable anymore. Gotta love floppy disks and their unreliability. Thumbs up. All right, so on the test kit here, I am going to go and start the music. Okay, it's still spice it up. They haven't changed anything. All right, unfortunately, there's a ton of glare on here and uh, because everything is so precarious, I can't really get it situated in a better way. So here are the two audio channels that are coming out of the Paula chip there and right there. So those are the vias that would go up to over here where the audio circuitry is. Now this is the op amp chip and I'm pretty sure pin one is right there closest to me on the right side. Now pin nine and 13 is the input from the Paula chip. Now, of course we know that those are almost, well, it's gotta be definitely connected. So there is pin nine. And right there is pin 13. Of course, we see the input as we should. In fact, over here, I'm just switching this to 500 Hertz sine. It looks like 10 kilohertz, 500 and music are the possibilities. Obviously a sine wave, it's gonna be easier to see. So let's uh, test these points here again. 
and there's the sine wave coming out of the Apollo chip. Now, you can ignore how noisy it is. That's because I'm using a really long ground lead, and that's not a problem. All right, back to the op amp. So we have the sine wave coming in here on pin 13. Now, pin 14 on the op amp and also pin 8 here are the outputs. And there's pin 14, and there is the sine wave, but it's much lower. And then that's pin 8, which also has an output, but it's also much lower. All right, let's take a look right here at pin 3 which is that one. Okay, so we do see a sine wave. And we look at pin one, and changing this to one volt per division, and we're pretty much getting nothing, no signal. There's a little bit of a signal there. And on the other stage, which is pin seven, similar, we're getting pretty much nothing. And on pin six, which is right here, we are getting a little bit of an input. Now, before I condemn this op amp to being bad, we gotta keep doing some more checking. So notice right here on this stage, it has two extra pins, four and 11, plus V and minus V. And we can see plus V right here and minus V. These are generated from minus five volts through a hundred ohm resistor. And there's a little bit going to ground here. That's minus V. And then for plus V right here, which is plus 12 volts, has a similar little filter stage. And it has this line, which runs off here as a voltage reference, which goes over here onto the input stages. Now I know those resistors and those other passive components are right in this area here. I can kind of spy them under that RAM board, but they're not marked on the back. So it's hard for me to figure out what's what. What I can do though, is I can check the input pins for the voltage. Now let's check pin four, which is the V plus, should be plus 12 volts. And I am on two volts per division. So 12 volts would be up here somewhere and we're pretty much getting nothing. Meanwhile, pin 11, I am actually getting minus 4.43 volts, which is this right here. All right, I'm gonna turn off the Amiga. Okay, so pretty much we can be sure of something here. Either the op amp is dead, and basically if it's shorted internally, what's gonna happen on the 12 volt rail here is this 100 ohm resistor is probably gonna get super, super hot, which means that this 100 ohm resistor here is dropping all of the voltage, that plus 12 is turning into like 0.5 because of that's dropping that voltage. Now there are some possibilities besides the op amp being shorted internally. It's possible like something like this cap is shorted that is causing it to pull this almost down to zero. Now there is also this trace here that goes off to this V ref, which I assume is like some five volt rail here, it goes through a 1%, 1.15K ohm resistor. I don't know what this is supposed to be, but I need to check to see what pin 10 and 12 are when this machine is powered up. I think that this cap is gonna be blocking the DC, so it's not gonna have 12 volts on it. I assume we should be seeing something like four point something volts on these uh, input pins here. Okay, I just powered up the machine here. It's not gonna boot, but we don't actually need to boot it up to measure these voltages. Okay, we're getting about 2.81 volts. Now this is measured with the oscilloscope, so it's not the most accurate, but there is a voltage there. And actually, now that I look at it, it's a 1.15K, 1.1K, and that goes actually to ground. So yeah, that implies that this should be around two point something volts. So really it seems like the issue exists here around the V plus. So either this cap is shorted or the op amp is shorted or somehow drawing way too much current and dropping the voltage across this 100 ohm resistor. So what I need to do is let's flip this board over and I'm gonna remove that RAM board so we can take a look at the top side. All right, we have the Amiga 1000 board and I've already removed the screws from this little RAM add-on board. So let's see, yeah, I'll just pop this off of the little pins that it's on. Careful not to bend or break anything. It's very stuck on. There it is. And there is the motherboard. So it looks like what Commodore did is they just removed these four ICs and they added an extra pin header there, there, and there. And almost certainly they transferred the ICs that would have been on the motherboard onto the here. And it's actually labeled 257 and 257. And these two chips here are labeled EN and CAS. And right here, this chip says EN next to it. And this one says CAS. So I bet these two chips which are, what are these? These are PAL chips. So these two PALs are probably installed on the motherboard originally in these two positions. And then this chip's a 244, that's a 244, and these are 257s right here. 
and there's an LS244 and an LS244, and then there are two F257s right here. So I wouldn't be surprised if these two chips, these two chips, and these two chips are normally just installed on the motherboard. And I suppose if I wanted to turn this thing back into a normal Amiga 1000 using kickstart ROMs on these four positions, I could probably do it. I just have to transfer these two PAL chips here and here, and then these chips here I just need to replace with the appropriate logic chips, and then it should work. Looking back on the board here, these are 64K, so that's 128, 256K of RAM right here. I am aware of some modifications you can do to this board by like cutting a trace and you add a resistor or something like that. That disables this extra memory, but makes the computer still work because obviously I can't, well, if I turn it on like this, without this installed, it's not gonna boot up. It'll turn on, but it's not gonna work. Okay, so here's the audio circuitry. So there's the op amp that we're potentially having problems with. And take a look at that. Look at that resistor, it's all black. That is R95. And right there, R95, the 12 volt resistor that is dropping all the current, right there. That resistor is in serious overheat mode. Okay, I have the multimeter set up for continuity. I'll just have it off camera here so we can poke around a little bit. So this resistor, I assume on this side, I can see a trace, it's going over here to the op amp. So that is the 12 volt input. This side of the resistor here is probably connected to 12 volts, which is probably gonna be this orange wire, and that is it. So definitely something is shorting that resistor almost to ground. So let's touch the pin of this op amp here to ground. And we're getting 1.2 ohms. Now remember, I said it might not be this op amp, and it might be one of the capacitors. Possibly this cap right here, C93. It's an electrolytic 100 microfarad 16 volts. This is C93. Now the problem is, unfortunately, there's no easy way for me to tell if it's the cap that's shorted or it's the op amp, unless I cut either, or well, if I remove this capacitor, or I just cut the pin on the op amp. My money is gonna be that it's the op amp and not the cap. The cap can short, it's just a rare failure mode. So I'm just gonna cut the leg on the op amp. I am gonna do it in a way where I can re-solder the leg if I need to. All right, the pin is cut. Let's go from this side of the resistor to the ground on here. <gasps> 1.2 ohms. So it is still shorted, it's not the op amp. I'm sorry, op amp. I accused you falsely. C93 right here, I assume, has gotta be the culprit. So I'm just gonna mark the top of it with a line. That is C93. Now, it may not be this. Let me continue to poke around a little bit more. Okay, so on the schematics here, C94, I was gonna look for that, but it's actually missing on the board. It's not even installed. So it looks like this 12 volt rail is not even connected to the VREF at all. How about C89 here, this 0.1? C89 is gonna be one of these little blue capacitors here, and unfortunately the markings are underneath them, so I can't really see what they are. So let's just figure out which one of these is shorted. Okay, it's that one there at 1.14 ohms. These other ones aren't shorted, so they're not a problem. So 1.14 ohms on these caps. Let's check the resistance across this electrolytic. And that's giving me 1.10 ohms, which is lower resistance or closer to zero than the, uh, the smaller cap. So it really does point to this cap being a failure. All righty, let's try to remove this from the board. Uh, interesting, this is 220 microfarad, 16 volts. Let's check for short. It's gone, the short is gone. This cap has gone short. Let's check it right on the leads. 1.12 ohms. Look at that, a shorted cap. Took out the sound on this Amiga. All right, let me just clean up the pads here, get them empty, there we go. For replacement, I'm gonna use 100 microfarad at 25 volts. It is less than what was actually in the board, but it is what's called for on the schematic. So I think it should be totally fine. Alrighty, the new cap is in. I just need to fix this leg I cut on the IC. So I'm just gonna bend it over a little bit and put a blob of solder on it. There we go. You'd almost never know that I cut it. Now, the one thing I'm noticing here is I think Desi switched out these jacks thinking that somehow they were bad. And it looks like the ones he put in aren't really on the board properly. 
It's hard to tell what's happening with these things. I'm gonna try to remove them. All right, I removed these two jacks here and there's definitely kind of some damage to the board here. Looks like a good amount of the V has actually been ripped out. So I'm gonna need to reattach these and make sure that things are connected. So that is the sound output that goes to this pin and a lot of that copper is missing. And on the other side of the board, it's a trace underneath and a lot's missing as well. And I happen to have some brand new ones that are the right color. I think these are the right ones to go in the board. Yep, they are. I'm gonna bend the pins over here. Try to help these stay in the board because <laughs> there's so little copper left. Hmm, this sucks. I'm not really holding out hope. This may not work very well. Yep, and just like I thought, these are not actually connected. Okay, this one is, but this one here, it's not. And that's probably exactly why I only heard audio a little bit out of one speaker, because these were already damaged. Man, that really sucks. These are barely holding in there. And in case you're wondering, I cannot solder them onto these larger pads right next door because these are actually ground as part of the same shield as everything else here. All right, well, I'm gonna to try to reinforce this with a little piece of metal here. And in the process, I'm gonna connect it to the via here where it's actually not connected anymore. Even though these move around a bit, they're gonna have a nice solid connection to the via they need to be connected to. I just realized I didn't check which is the right and the left for the color coding. So these might be reversed, but if they are, oh well. All right, we're not totally done. I need to check this resistor now. We need to see if uh, it's actually 100 ohms anymore and maybe change that out. Okay, I just switched this over to ohms. Let's just check what this is here. Wow, 100 ohms. <laughs> it survived, it's burned, but it survived. That thing is a survivor resistor right there. I know some people probably say I should change that, but I'm gonna leave it because it works and why change it if it works? Okay, what I'm gonna do lastly is I'm just gonna double check these other caps to make sure none of the other ones are shorted because maybe one of them was shorted, who knows? Okay, have the motherboard back together to a state where we can boot this machine up and give it a try. As you may notice, it's much cleaner now than it was. And yeah, that's because I gave the motherboard and this top card a full wash with soap and water. So now they are looking mighty clean. Unfortunately, the RF shields that are on here, like on these connectors here, that's all very tarnished. I think this machine was exposed to a good amount of moisture at some point in its life. So yeah, all of the RF shielding, at least on the top side, is very tarnished. So when taking apart a machine and then putting it back together with having washed it and everything, it's always a little bit of a mystery if it's all gonna work when I turn it back on. So I am ready for the first power on and let's see what happens. Okay, great, that's a very good sign. Hopefully it goes to the white screen. It just takes a moment here on the initial power up. There we go, okay, great. So it's looking for the kickstart disc right now. The floppy drive is not connected, so I have to connect up this temporary uh, floppy drive arrangement, which I didn't really cover before, but I'm using this floppy adapter that a viewer sent in. This adapts regular PC floppy drives to work on the Amiga. All right, it's powered up again, and I have the floppy drive here with the kickstart disc in there. Sounds like it's booting. Oh, awesome. System still works, at least to this extent. All right, I forgot to hook the speakers up. Let's hook these up to the newly fixed audio outputs here. And now time for the Amiga test kit. Let's see if we hear that wonderful mod music. And here we go, audio. There it is. All right, uh, let's uh, turn off, let's see, left channel. Okay, so right channel is all we're hearing now, and left channel. It's good, it works. Now one thing about the audio output on these very early Amiga 1000s is this low pass filter is basically always turned on. 
On later machines, you could control whether the low pass filter was turned on and off, and the power LED would change brightness to reflect the setting of the low pass filter. But on this particular machine, you can control the brightness of the power LED by pushing this. I'm not sure it's really showing up, but it is getting brighter and dimmer. But that has no effect on the low pass filter on the audio circuitry. It is always turned on. And because of that, the audio output on these early 1000s is kind of soft sounding. The low pass filter rolls off a lot of that high frequency noise you get from 8-bit audio. But the problem with that is, is most people, including myself, are very used to the sound of that. And that kind of adds a little crispness to the high end that this machine is lacking. When I was looking for schematics and other information on this machine for doing this repair, I did find a mod or people talking about a mod that could be done on this machine to disable that low pass filtering. I don't think I'm gonna do that because I wanna keep this machine basically like an original Rev A Amiga 1000. I have other Amigas I can use if I wanna hear the high fidelity audio that it's capable of. This was the way the original designers made this board, so I'm just gonna leave it as it was from the factory. Now I've been thinking whether to reinstall this RAM board that's designed for this Rev A Amiga 1000, and I've decided I think at this, at least at this point, I'm not gonna reinstall it, nor am I gonna install this Kickstarter board. I just wanna have the original 1985 Amiga 1000 experience, which involves booting up that Kickstart floppy disk first, and then booting up Workbench after that. Maybe at a future time, I'll decide to reinstall this back into this machine, but for now, it's gonna be bone stock. Now, I've been going through other diagnostic screens in the test kit, and so far, everything is passing perfectly on this machine. So I'm gonna say, at this point, it's now time to put this thing back in its original case, which I have been spending time cleaning up and doing a little bit of Retrobrite on. And with that, that's it for this video. As you can see, the Amiga 1000 is all back together and it's working. It's actually displaying this image here. I have Deluxe Paint loaded, as you can see there. There's still a few issues I need to work out with this machine and I'll have to get to that at a future date. The disk drive, which I took from an Amiga 1010 disk drive like this, it doesn't quite fit in this computer for some reason. It seems like there's two different versions inside this drive and the first uh, disk drive I was using, that one fit in the case a lot better than this one. This one does fit, but now the monitor's sitting on top of the case, I can't fully get the discs in and out because the case kind of flexes a little bit since it's plastic. Also, it overhangs the CPU just a little bit that actually completely prevents me from using the RAM expansion card that I had that was originally in this machine. I only have one Amiga 1010 disk drive left and it's the one that's sitting right here. And it's in absolutely perfect condition with no yellowing or scratches at all. Looks brand new. So I really don't feel like taking this one apart to take the disk drive out to stick it inside the computer. So I may need to try to, at least for the alignment issue, try to slot the holes or something or figure out some way to make this align better in the case. As for the repair on the machine itself, that capacitor was the only fault on this machine. Well, at that and the rear audio jacks, which I've since changed out. So the audio is completely working perfectly. I've run some games through this machine and they sound just great. Unfortunately, 512K, which is all this thing's got on it for RAM, is not really enough to run some more advanced programs like most mod players and things like that. And especially Workbench 1.3 is a little bit of a hindrance when it comes to compatibility with slightly more modern software. As you may notice, there's still a little bit more retro bright. I need to do the mouse, it's kind of yellow. The eject button on the disk drive that I salvaged and put in this machine, that's a bit yellow. And this monitor needs a little bit of a tune up and it's also pretty yellow. So now that it's summertime, I'll try to get to this stuff as well. It may or may not end up in a video. I really wanna thank Desi who originally gave me this Amiga 1000. I know Desi was trying to fix this machine before I got it and who would have suspected that a shorted capacitor, electrolytic capacitor is what took out the audio on this machine. Honestly, during most of my troubleshooting process, I go around checking for shorted components like diodes sometimes, or maybe tantalums, but shorted electrolytics is just not something that comes up very often. It's only been twice in everything I've ever fixed that had a shorted electrolytic. So I think I've gone on long enough. That's gonna be it for real now. A oh, huge thanks to my patrons who support me and the channel. It means so much to me. You can become a patron if you want. There's a link down below. You'll, you'll get access to early videos and the higher tiers get access to like behind the scenes stuff and other random stuff that I sometimes post just for them. Comment down below if you haven't or if you have any thoughts on this video, of course, thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. So there is my second channel. There's also merch and I guess that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, 
and I will see you next time. Bye. Take a look at this. The Amiga 1000 was used on the show Stranger Things in season four on Netflix. And there it is. There is the logo from the first season for Stranger Things. And it looks absolutely amazing displayed on the Amiga. And this is absolutely on the Amiga. Here's a deluxe paint that I have it in. Of course, I converted it. It's a 32 color image and it looks spectacular.